Hi everyone, and thanks for coming to Pi Texas. Uh, I hope you are not too sleepy after lunch. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goldsmith. I came a long way from Israel. Uh, I like everything about computers and software. Uh, I got a chance to work on many open source projects on many fields, and I like wine as well. Uh, I am a current, I'm currently a research team lead at Gunrate. Um, Gunrate helps companies optimize their workloads. Uh, improve performance and leverage that to reduce costs. Now, uh, this is uh, no, this is my first session given outside of Israel, so uh, good luck for me. And it's going to be quite technical. Uh, feel free to ask me uh, to stop me at any point and ask questions, and please do that. I intend it to be more entertaining and mind-opening and not explicitly technical. So stop me. So. We'll start with something a bit bombing, uh, and I do not intend to bomb you. Um, the internet is full of these graphs. Um, I'm sadly no magician, so if you expected uh, this kind of speed ups uh, for my session, then you won't have them, sadly. Uh, if you do want this kind of speed up, then you have Rust Texas over there. You can try it out. Uh, kidding. <laughs> How are we doing? Uh, what can we do to improve the performance of our Python code? Well, there are plenty of options from different frameworks like uh, Namba, which helps you uh, create better code for mathematical computations. Um, Async IO, which makes better use of threads. Uh, you have profiles that let you identify code bottlenecks and improve them. And you can try different uh, Python implementations such as PyPy. And you can try to improve the algorithms of your code. All these methods can help you improve performance, but we're not going to focus them. We're going to focus things at the level of Python itself, and specifically C Python, which is the Python you're all probably using, and version 3.10, which is the latest one. So what is Python itself? Uh, when I say that, I actually meant the Python interpreter. The interpreter, uh, which includes the Python runtime, is responsible to take your Python text and make sure that your, the computer that runs it actually does what you requested it to do. This, among other things, includes uh, compiling Python text code to Python bytecode, which can be viewed with the this module. Uh, the interpreter then interprets the bytecode, performing one small task at a time uh, to achieve the ultimate goal of your code. Now, there is much more under the hood. Uh, uh, for example, garbage collection and managing the Python environment itself. Now, uh, why should I care about the interpreter? Well, the interpreter is our friend. It tries to run the, our code and it tries to run it as fast as possible. It involves many, many optimization techniques during that process. If we pay some level of attention uh, to the details underneath, we can help it do a better job and we'll have our code run faster. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So, I have collected a number of demos. Uh, for simplicity, I chose uh, demos focusing on dictionaries, which are a key component of the Python runtime. Uh, there are many, many other optimizations, though. Uh, once again, feel free to stop me uh, with any questions during the demos. So, first one will uh, revolve around the dictionary lookup types. Um, dictionaries are complex. They power many uh, parts of the Python runtime, from the attributes of classes and instances, to global and built-in variables, and to plain data structures, such as things we uh, marshal or unmarshal with JSON. All dictionaries behave the same to us. We can access keys, delete keys, insert keys, but they actually have numerous underlying implementation, actually four to be precise. Um, and now we will see the demo of them. Uh, uh, uh. I won't touch it again. <laughs> so, um, I have prepared here a demo which displays the uh, speed effect uh, of dictionary lookups depending on the key types that we are using. For that, I have wrote a utility library which the code of it would be shared later uh, to display the internal uh, attributes of a dictionary those not exposed for us in the Python lab. So I will create a small dictionary with some string keys and mapping to integers. Uh, and we can use this function to print um, information about the 
Now, the thing, we, the thing I want to focus uh, on this demo is the lookDict function. As I said, there are numerous uh, implementations for the lookup method uh, for different dictionaries depending on the dictionary type, the keys type. Uh, in this case, we, have, uh, we are using the function called lookDict Unicode no dummy, which is a long name uh, to mean the dictionary has only string keys and no deleted entries. That is, you have never performed a delete operation. Uh, so I have a small function to benchmark the dictionary. Um, not this one. Uh, we can run it and see how much time does it take to uh, look up for the dict uh, 10,000 times. Uh, so it takes about 380 microseconds. Uh, now we can delete an entry. And if we print the dictionary again, we can see that it, its lookup method has changed because we've performed the deletion. Sorry? Yeah, I'll just get back to the mic. Um, so since I've performed the deletion, uh, the dictionary now uses the standard look dict unicode method, which is a bit slower than the, uh, no, the no dummy one, the one without deletions. Uh, but if we time it now, I don't suppose we will see a large effect. Uh, let's see. A bit, a bit of an effect, but now let's do something more brutal and insert a non-string key. Uh, if we print the dictionary now, we can see that it has moved to the lookDict function, which is the generic one that works with all types of keys, from integers to floats to classes to whatever you can choose. Uh, if we benchmark it now, we can see that it has become, should have become even more slower. Um, it can go to about 30% slower now uh, that the lookDict function has changed. So uh, the technical reasoning behind it is that the lookDict Unicode function and the variant no dummy uh, can assume that uh, all strings, all keys are strings, and it can use faster lookups. It can directly call the string comparison functions, and uh, since string comparison never in can raise exceptions or do any kind of harm. It does not need to wrap uh, the uh, key checking with uh, exception catching, and it has less work to do, so it's faster. Now, you may be thinking it was very insignificant. It's all in the matter of nanoseconds or microseconds. What effect does it have on, on a real application? So um, just need to remember that dictionary lookups can Cost about 10% of your Python program, uh, Python program runtime. So now those 20% of improvement that I've shown you, we take 2% of your application, which is significant. Uh, so you need to look at the screen now. Uh, just the demo itself. Okay. Now another demo. Uh, this will revolve about instance dictionaries uh, and their sizes. Uh, we start with a small explanation on the uh, dictionary structure in C Python. A dictionary object called a uh, PyDict object, which is this one, uh, this one, uh, holds a reference to its keys object, which is called PyDict keys object. The keys object holds the key entries in DK entries, which is a simple array of objects uh, of the value and the key and the hash items. Uh, there's also DK indexes, which is an array that maps the hash results to the uh, entries in the DK entries. So the key lookup, uh, uh, we calculate the hash of the key, we find the index uh, via DK indexes, and then we get an index into DK entries, and finally we get the value. Uh, that's also roughly how things look like in uh, Python 2. Uh, now since Python 3.3, uh, we have this separation of PyDict's keys object, and why is it required? Um, so uh, the reason we are behind the separation was to support key sharing dictionaries. As I mentioned, one of the uh, very common use cases of dict is to store instance attributes. Behind the scenes, all instances such as x1 and x2 in this case uh, have a dictionary that maps their attribute names to the attribute values, uh, except for when using slots, uh, more on that later. Um, if we look at the two dictionaries that we have here, uh, we can see that the share most uh, share a lot in common. Uh, DK indices is actually the same. Uh, DK entries is an array of the same size. It holds the same keys, but the values are different because these are different objects after all. Uh, 
So, uh, came key sharing dictionaries, PEP, which was PEP 412, I think. Uh, and with this PEP, we have one copy of the keys object and multiple dictionaries using this, uh, this very copy. Uh, now they have an additional values array, which contains just the values, and the indexes from the DK entries are used to uh, index this array as well. Now this has a drastic effect on the memory consumption of Python objects, as we will now see on the next demo. Once again, make it a bit larger. So here I have a quite an orthodox, uh, simple OOP demo class called Animal which has the name and the species and the age attributes. And if the animal has a, has a sound or a smell, then we will also store these attributes. So let's copy that to our demo. Uh, and now we can make a fish animal. I named him Flipper. Uh, and we can print the dictionary attributes uh, of Flipper. Uh, we can see that it's using the lookdict split method, uh, which is the one used for key sharing dictionaries. Uh, we can see that it is about one, not about, but exactly uh, 104 bytes in size. Uh, we can see the entries, and we can see that the, its keys has the ref count of two. Two dictionaries are refer referencing uh, these keys. Uh, one is the flipper object, and the other one is the animal class, which remembers that this is the, uh, the keys object used for instances of animal. Now let's create a skunk, which has a smelly attribute. Uh, and we can print the attributes of the skunk. Uh, funky, let's go. Okay. Uh, so it's, again, using the lookdict split method. And it has the same size. Uh, now the keys ref count is free, because we have created an, another object which uses the same keys. Uh, and now I'll create a cat, which has no smell, but has a sound. Uh, and if we print the cat now, uh, we can see that it's not using the look dict split method anymore, and its size has grown drastically. Uh, and the keys ref count is one. What happened here? So what happened is that the keys had to, to be resized because we added more attributes, more different attributes. The shared keys had those four attributes, uh, the name, the species, the age, and the smell. And now we needed to add the sound attribute, and there was no room in the keys object. So we had to create a new one. Uh, by creating a new one, we basically unshared the key sharing dictionaries for this class, for the Milo instance. Uh, and actually, for all new instances, if we now recreate Flipper, and print it. Uh, you can see that it will not use the look dict split method anymore, but the Unicode one. And its size has grown more than twice the size, uh, which is bad. Uh, and now, actually, we, we can never revert it back. From this moment, CPython will no longer try to share the keys of any instance of the animal class. We actually have to restart the interpreter for that, so let's restart it uh, and repaste this code. Now, if we recreate an animal uh, and let's say print Milo, uh, we can see that again it is using look dict split, but now I will use the mute method, which is, uh, you can see its code, it's basically deleting the sound. So. I can do that, uh, and I can print the dict again, and it again stopped being a shared dictionary. Uh, and now, if I do create another animal, it will not use the shared keys anymore. The moment I've deleted an attribute from a class, from an instance of a class, key sharing is stopped for all future instances of that class. Uh, these are the uh, code areas from CPython where it decides to skip or to bail out on the key sharing because we've broken the assumptions of no deletion and no resize after the init method. Um, now, this effect is huge, uh, so do make sure to never delete instance attributes and to always initialize everything in your init. Uh, 
Uh, now, a word on slots. Slots are a pretty archaic feature of Python, uh, which allow you to define a static list of uh, attributes for instances. Uh, and then each instance will not have uh, a dict, but only an array of values for those uh, attributes. Uh, and it greatly uh, reduces the memory footprint of each instance. Uh, now, since key sharing dictionaries, which are not as good as slots, but uh, in my opinion, it basically renders slots uh, useless uh, because it gives most of the effect, which is pretty cool that we have a seamless optimization that replaced an optimization that required us, the developers, to manually type and define uh, the attributes that we want to use. Um, Anyway, it's pretty cool, and slots are uh, dead in my opinion. Okay, so one last example uh, would be about global variables. Uh, so far, everything was about dictionaries, and the same would be here. Global variables are based on dictionaries. Uh, a function defined in a module has its globals attached to the dictionaries of the module. So a global variable access is basically uh, lookups uh, in the dictionary of that module. Now, globals are very common, and as we've seen so far, dictionaries are not uh, very fast. Loading global variables has been taking a significant portion uh, of standard uh, Python applications, so a solution was sought. Now, under the hood, um, global variables are read with the load global Python opcode. Each load global opcode uh, is attached to the name. Uh, it's supposed to load, for example, in this case, a global variable. Uh, now, CPython implements a concept called inline caches, which is caching at the site of an operation, like a call site for a function, in contrary to a cache placed on the target side, for example, a function wrapped with a caching decorator. Uh, now, inline caches are a very powerful concept, and they are used in many, many language runtimes, and even CPython itself uses them for many more areas, not only for global variables. So how does it work? Well, each dictionary in Python has a version field attached to it. The version of a dict changes uh, whenever the dict changes, assigning a new value, deleting an, deleting an existing value, modifying a value. On the right hand, you have a simple Python code that reads the version of a dict. Uh, and if we modify the dict and read it again, the version will change. Um, the load global cache, uh, inline cache, stores the version of the globals and the built-ins, but uh, we won't get into that. Upon the next run of the same opcode uh, in this same function, if the version hasn't changed, then we can skip the lookup and uh, uh, use the cached object, which is cool. Now, this cache can break, uh, but I have 10 minutes, so I think we will skip this demo, and I'll just explain about it. Um, this optimization, unlike the other two, which are ones that break, and once they break, you have to restart the interpreter or redefine the class or recreate the dictionary, uh, in order to revert to the previous state. This optimization is self-filling. If you do change the version of a dictionary, for example, if you do modify a global variable, then upon the next time, the cache will just uh, self-heal and, uh, and we'll continue caching uh, uh, going forward. Uh, so does it even matter for real code? Well, the larger the module is, uh, the more functions that uh, it has, and the more functions are using the same global variables and the more likely that the cache is to break. Uh, so for example, uh, to the right I have a screenshot from a random file uh, from Celeri. I don't think you're seeing anything, but the idea is just to demonstrate that it's a lot of code. Uh, it's about a thousand lines of code, and it's enough for just one of those functions to modify one small global variable, and the caches of all functions in that module break, uh, which is a shame. So global variables are it's not as design, par uh, design uh, pattern stock, but global variables are not very good uh, generally, but modifying them is even worse, so try not to. Okay, now, enough for the demos. Uh, I wanted to give a short note on other languages, since most of what I've discussed is uh, relevant to all dynamic interpreted languages. Uh, I gave examples specific to CPython, but the same concepts remain. Uh, there are many seamless optimizations performed by the underlying engines. Uh, taking a node, for example, uh, we're in PyTexas and not in Node Texas. Uh, 
But uh, had we been at Node Texas, uh, there would be countless examples to give about Node. Uh, as a small one, uh, we have seen four different lookup methods uh, in Python. Uh, Node has about 20 different underlying implementations for maps or uh, objects, which are the equivalents of dicts. Uh, now, Node is based on the V8 engine, which also powers the Chrome browser. Uh, it has uh, very advanced optimizations in place, which means that there is much to lose if your code doesn't play well with them. Uh, I won't give a node example here because, as I said, I'm running out of time, but I have attached a great read uh, about similar types of optimization in optimizations in node. Shortly speaking, uh, the author managed to cut down the execution time of a CPU having node script by about uh, 4x uh, with many techniques relating to the internals of V8, the engine. So if you've liked uh, what I talked about here, then I uh, encourage you to read it, uh, give it a try. Uh, now, a word on CPython itself. Uh, CPython is getting improved lately by much. Uh, since 3.10, which is October 21, I think, Eric and Mark, who are co-devs, and Guido, the creator of Python, uh, they are focusing on improving uh, CPython performance in a non-breaking way uh, so that everyone can benefit from that. Uh, this includes tons of new interpreter level and runtime level optimizations, many similar to what we've seen today. Uh, now, this is a very bright future, and 3.11 itself is going to be a huge boost, about 2x the speed, so you can just dump everything I said today and upgrade to 3.11 and you will get most of the benefits. Uh, but as I mentioned for Node.js, on the one hand, more optimizations means uh, that we have, we'll have more to benefit from, and on the other end, failing to benefit from those uh, new optimizations will incur a higher cost, because now the difference between optimized and unoptimized is larger. Uh, so the, for the best performance going forward, it will become more and more important to understand the engine and to understand how the, your program is handled by the interpreter. Uh, and our point about the, that, that's about two years plan, uh, a cool repository to read about the futures of CPython, but and in CPython 3.13, I think, they plan to reach about 5x performance, which is pretty cool. Um, now, some takeaways. From these two snippets, which do the same, uh, which one you'd say is faster and which one is more Pythonic? More Pythonic. More Pythonic, more Python code. Well, the, the top one is the more Pythonic one. It is concise and it, it is easy to read, uh, but it is about twice as slow. Uh, I'm not instructing you to unpythonize your code. Uh, we write Python because it is easy, fast, and pure. Readability counts. Uh, making your code complex is never the target. If you make your code complex, then move to another language. But do remember that the interpreter is your friend and it wants to help you run your code faster. Those few snippets that I've shown you here are just a small bit, the tip of the, of the iceberg of what CPython encompasses. Uh, remember those details and pay attention to them where needed and your code shall be rewarded. Uh, and on a final note, um, I hope that this talk has opened your mind to this world of engine level optimizations. Uh, personally, I find it uh, very interesting and cool. I spent a lot of time, lots of time reading CPython's code just to understand those uh, bits and things. But if we stop uh, for a moment and think one level above about uh, improving performance, then you should start with profiling. Any type of optimization performed without profiling is most usually a waste of your time. So start with profiling and only then look at all those, all those concepts I've explained today. That's it. Any questions so far? It's not mixing key types. Uh, his question was uh, if my example was about mixing key types, the first example. So it's not about mixing key types in general. It's specifically, CPAN specifically has better handling for string keys because we have many dictionaries that are only string keys. All, uh, dictionaries that are the dictionaries of instances and classes and modules and they're all only string keys. Uh, so specifically mixing string keys with non-strings is bad. Everything else just goes to the default method so you can put whatever you want. Uh, but if you have a dictionary that is mostly string keys, 
then kick out the known strings because it will make it faster by 30 percent. All right. Well, thanks. And one final note. Uh, I will put the code snippets I mentioned uh, on that repository to the top. And uh, I'm also dropping you a link to a repository called uh, WTF Python, which is a cool repository containing many intriguing snippets about the behavior of Python. Uh, two of the demos I presented here are, are actually snippets that I have contributed to WTF Python about a year ago. Uh, check it out. It's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs>